Mary Finucan is the daughter of an immigrant and the mother of a daughter who just turned double digits this week. We thought we might see her. She's delightful. Uh, she co-leads the Rochester Veterans Writing Group at Writers and Books. It's a monthly writing workshop for military veterans and their family members. She enjoys running trails, drinking excessive amounts of tea, and spending time with her amazing 10-year-old. Tonight she will read Almost Home. The story begins like this. There was a man, an immigrant, who had been living in the United States for seven years. He had done what he was supposed to do. He'd sent money home. He'd made his way. He was done now and ready to go back to Ireland. He decided he would return to the small place he was from, home, and join the Guardi, the Irish police force. And then he met my mom. They met in a place called the Irish Club. It no longer exists, and though it sounds like a multicultural museum of sorts, it was actually a bar. <laughs> a restaurant, my mother corrects. I don't believe my father was hanging out at a restaurant. I've seen him at restaurants, and it is painful for everyone involved. <laughs> it goes like this with little variation. A server approaches the table, introduces him or herself, my father asks for a cup of tea. The server is delighted to detect a brogue. <laughs> the server brings tea. My father drinks the tea, keeps the tea bag, and asks for more hot water. Not warm water. Not even mostly hot water. Hot is in just finished boiling. Repeat this nine times, and by the end of the meal, the server is no longer delighted. Brogue or not, and the adult children are ready to dive under the table. <laughs> it is even painful to watch the initial fawning take place, knowing what will unfold in predictable <laughs> So I have never bought that the Irish pub was anything else than a pub, because had it been a restaurant, and had my mother witnessed this persistent request for nine cups of tea, she would have never agreed to a first date. <laughs> but anyway, it's where they met, the immigrant ready to head on home, and the school teacher. The story shifts at this point, not greatly, but enough to add an air of mystery. She was out with a friend, he was with his friends, he asked her for a date, she did not agree. She thought he might be married, Eventually, she agreed to a date, and she told him that she attended daily mass. He began to show up in the pews there, casually, I imagine, just <laughs> dropping by church to meet the Lord, <laughs> and pick up a pretty lady at mass. <laughs> this beginning, too, so perfectly tells all that is needed to know about my parents. The beginning, sometimes, is just like the middle, and all that comes after. That my mother gave him the option to join her at Mass made him one very lucky person, because I don't ever recall having much choice in my attendance of <laughs> daily Mass and often weekly confession. So this is where they began, in the wooden pews of an ornate and beautiful Catholic church. It is also where they got engaged six months later, when my father, again in the pew beside her, showed her the ring that he had for her. His plan to go home to Ireland had evaporated. They got married, she taught, he worked at Xerox. My father also began coursework toward a college degree because when you marry a school teacher, college is in the cards. <laughs> they rented in the Park Ave area, bought a home which they described as gray from top to bottom, every wall, every molding, every wooden bookcase had been painted gray. <laughs> they began peeling gray paint, scraping it, restoring the natural wood bookshelves and stairs and floor. On the weekends, the Irish would come over and bring their instruments and play music until the early morning hours. There was not much furniture, plenty of wide open rooms, and the walls were halfway to beautiful, which lent itself well to open jam sessions with fiddles and accordions. <laughs> then, five years after they'd wed, and just as they'd scraped the last bit of gray paint, they received a life-changing phone call telling them they would be parents to a baby a five-month-old girl arriving from Vietnam in two days. They flew to receive her, 
and eight months later welcomed their second child, a boy, then another girl, then another boy, and finally another girl. Whatever house projects they were working on were set aside at that time and remained set aside permanently. <laughs> the house froze in time, as complete as it was before the arrival of one, two, three, four, five, and not a touch more. My mother's motto was, everything comes back in style someday. <laughs> and so, orange shag rug and striped orange curtains hung, and indeed, decades later, they are now back in style. <laughs> back. Back is a word that indicates something behind you in the past. It is also a word frequently used when we go to Ireland, returning to the small town where my father is from, a town of 800 people, one church, one school, and 13 pubs. <laughs> In the small town, we'd run into villagers who would stop and say, your father's back now, glad you're back. And like that, it was as swift and encompassing as he, you, us. He's back, you're back, we're all here now. As our family grew, we traveled back to Ireland as a group until I was five years old. After that trip, my parents changed their travel policy to one child at a time. <laughs> Each time my dad would go, he'd take one of us, and it went in birth order. This was painfully slow to wait, but eventually I got my turn. I went back at the age of 10 in what would be my father's last time with his father, who was 96 and had pneumonia. In November of that year, I spent 10 days in the damp outside and drying out from the damp inside by the fire, going on long walks with my dad to search for Holly, sleeping each night with hot water bottles, and waking to see my breath in puffs above my face. When you are a child, you can romanticize impossible things. When you are an adult, the same is true. The way my father told stories from childhood, there was such a rosy glow that I never understood why he left in the first place. His stories often revolved around being outside, meandering through fields and hills, and antics and pranks he and his friends and siblings often pulled. There were leprechauns too, of course, though he never caught one. <laughs> I thought all homes in Ireland were like the one I stayed in when I went back. I thought everyone had an outhouse where a rooster would wander in if you didn't close the door. <laughs> Which you could never close because the grass and nettles grew so thick. I thought every home had an open shed filled with wood and turf, and a pump from which to get your drinking water. Two ideas come to mind about leaving home, wherever home is. One idea is that if you launch too early, or leave because unfavorable circumstances require it, there is a freezing of yourself at the age of which you leave. Mm. The other idea is this one, regardless of how planned or unexpected, how joyful or sorrowful you're leaving, you can never go home. You can never go back. My father's stories are of hills and fields, quarries, fishing boats, running barefoot after his father to go with him to cut the turf, cruel teachers who humiliated their students, kind teachers who opened their hearts and shared generously of their time and knowledge, old maid aunts who always said yes, slipped the children coins for candy or a cowboy moving picture, bachelor uncles who whistled and smoked pipes and nodded by the fire. There were other details that seemed novel to me because I could not imagine them. Sleeping on a burlap bag stuffed with hay and sewn shut. Christmas morning, picking an unwrapped piece of hard candy from the bottom of a sock, removing lint and dirt expertly before popping it into his mouth. <laughs> he was 18 when he came here. He joined the Air Force and traveled to San Antonio, Houston, New York and Vietnam. He told me that when he was in basic training, he became friends with the black soldiers because they were the easiest for him to relate to. They were outsiders in their own country, and my father was an outsider in his country. Sure, he was Irish, but the English shadow hung over every hungry table, around every immigrant that left because there was not enough to eat. Though the Great Famine had taken place nearly 100 years before his birth, the effects, the hunger and poverty, were woven into the mist and hung over homes. The past is not prologue, the past is present. 
History was not a lesson in a book. Any occupied nation knows a different story, has lived a different chapter, than we who have never had an occupying force in our nation. One weighted fact from that era is this one. In a particular year, there was an increase in the export of food from Ireland to England, shipped from one island to the next, guided by British military guard. There went calves, bacon, ham, peas, beans, onions, salmon, rabbit, oysters, herring, lard, and honey, hmm. and butter, boats and boats of butter. From the most famine-stricken Irish villages of Killala, Kilrush, and Tralee, these foods were shipped to London, Liverpool, and Bristol. In the same year, 400,000 Irish children, women, and men starved to death, unable to afford the very food they grew at home. Over five years, about one million Irish starved to death. One million more emigrated out, driven by hunger to go anywhere they could eat. This brief period of time shaped not only those who lived it, but generations beyond. My father would come home from his meetings at Xerox, where donuts and pizza might be served, and he would bring whatever was left. Always he brought us the spoils of every meeting he had to sit through. I think of this, of him waiting as the others exit, asking what will be done with the untouched pizza pie, those 12 donuts, and then boxing them up and bringing them to us who descended vulture-like upon the trees. <laughs> In the Air Force, he connected more so with the black soldiers because he understood the part of slavery that comes after slavery is made illegal. Degradation gets steeped somewhere in the DNA, so much so that when the politics and policy eventually attempt to correct what never should have occurred, the living of it is handed from generation to generation. It goes overseas and is tangled in with all the other gifts of immigration. It is tucked into a recessive gene, emerging unexpectedly. My father is one of five. The boys, or he and his brothers, settled here in Rochester. The girls, or my two aunts, lived here a bit, but both settled back in Ireland, in their hometown, a half mile apart. One lives on the low road, one lives on the high road. These are not metaphors, but actual names of roads. <laughs> Only once have I ever seen my dad and his brothers and sisters all together. This was when their mother, my grandmother, died. At the age of 92, she was ill, and my aunt told us it was time to come. One by one we arrived, and she stayed in her bed, seeming to wait until the last of her sons flew in and drove to the family home. Under one roof, with all five of her living children, she died. Mm -hmm. I watched as my aunts and uncles grieved, mm -hmm. but also watched as they morphed into a sort of pecking order that seemed to go by birth order. Mm -hmm. It was the first time mm -hmm. since departing that they had been back together. Suddenly parentless, they became teenagers. <laughs> together, under one roof and home, so much had changed, and it appeared so little as well. My dad can recall the sharpest details about his childhood, his life in Ireland before he became an immigrant. The long thread that connects him there is never cut, but never brings him fully back. It's not true that you can never go back. You can always go back. But going back and being home, these are not the same. For some of us, home is ever ahead of us, one step into a future, like a mirage that moves every time you move toward it. And for those who are lucky, home is exactly where you are at this moment, neither where we are from nor something to work toward. Mm -hmm. There are wonders we miss because we are so deeply accustomed that we forget to notice. Mm -hmm. Some of these are tangible, invisible, but many are intangible, an invisible thing that hums within a culture, formed by a certain story or history, or the absence of it. These are the stories and threads that still pull others into this young country, that have them crossing borders, risking loss in life, to get somewhere that has been rumored to provide something more, something beyond what is possible where they are. Hunger and poverty propelled many Irish here, including my dad, and the life that unfolded for him here would not have been possible where he was born. 
There were moments growing up, even now, where he looks over at his five adult children, adult children, the mess of grandchildren, his wife fussing over us, and holds his tea and shakes his head. He's a crier, my dad. And this was discovered when we got hooked on Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> at the end of one particular episode, Charles Landon, or Pa, looks over his brood, their earthen house, and wells up. What a family, he says. Makes a man proud. Huh? We the children laughed at this, Pa crying, but looked over at my dad and caught him wiping a tear. So then we laughed at him, because <laughs> if you are Irish, this is how you demonstrate affection. <laughs> <laughs> you make fun of those you love. <laughs> so we did, until he laughed, and now every time we watch him looking over his brood, the Landon look creeping into his eye, <laughs> someone calls out the syrupy line. We leap from where we are, not always with thought or planning, but because we have to go. There is not time to consider everything, only time to go toward something. When we look back, we inevitably find that we are altered, or the place that held us a moment ago no longer exists. Where did it go? It was just there, the cleanest memory, the sweetest story. It was real, and it travels within the teller, sometimes shared, never released. We can go back, but only for a visit, rarely for long, and only to confirm that what was best about that place is in us now, no longer there, but tucked inside a secret pocket, never too far, and still never quite near enough. Thank you. That's how you show it.